Okay, we're about ready to get started this morning. Um, by way of announcements, just keep in mind those that are still uh, recovering and everything. I, I haven't heard anything uh, new on uh, Jim Smith. We visited him on last Wednesday, but uh, it's going to be a road. It's going to be a road. A little bit of time for him to get back. Um, it's been good to see Janice back with us, out, coming along. Okay. So continue to pray for Janice that the healing process continues to go well. Um, what's that? Oh, yes, I see that. Bay and Ray are back with us. That's good. Always good to see them. Um, and uh, other than that, I don't have any other things that I can think of off the top of my head. So I ask Brian if he would to come and lead us in a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Let's bow together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such an opportunity that we have to come together and worship without persecution. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that Ben is direct, as Ben directs our thoughts, that you'll help us to be good students of, of your word, help us to be guided, and help us, Lord, to focus so that we can be able to not be distracted by the worldly things, but yet focus on what we need to learn so that we can help, help to be able to serve you better. Thank you so much for each and every opportunity we have to gather together. We thank you for every soul that's here this morning. We pray for those that are sick and unable to be with us. We pray for those who have chosen to be away. We pray, Lord, that you will soften our hearts, help them to come closer together with us. Help us, Lord, as we continue to build throughout 2024, that you'll help us to build stronger than ever. Help us to be able to reach out to, to all those around us uh, that we Touch their lives. Help us, Lord, uh, to be the positive influence that we need to be. Help us not to say the wrong things and help us to be able to to be there whenever they need us. We uh, thank you so much for for the freedoms we enjoy. We pray for all those who are protecting those freedoms throughout the world, especially with watch over Mike as he's away from us right now serving. We uh, pray for all those who are trying to spread your word throughout the gospel We throughout the world. We uh, Pray, Lord, for their safety and their well-being as they continue to try to do your work. Help us, Lord, to do your will in our daily walk here at home. We thank you so much for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, now we're going to start breaking down the verse by verse of uh, Colossians chapter 1. And it'll start with verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ that are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Uh, the word apostle was a title given to uh, his chosen representatives by Christ himself, and it carries with it the idea of authority, they could speak on behalf of Christ and, in fact, did in several of the letters of the New Testament. And uh, Paul, or I mean, Christ even told Peter that the ones that he would bind on earth would be bound in heaven and the ones that he would loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. So their word uh, had authority. And it's sort of interesting that Paul brings this up right away because there were some in the church at Colossae that was being pulled away by the Gnostics, and Paul was uh, trying to assert his authority right away. 
He goes, he goes on to say that the letter was also uh, from Timothy, our brother, although the Greek has Timothy, the brother, and it might have been Kaufman thinks to, uh, because it was going to create a little bit of a, an issue, a firestorm, because the Gnostics weren't going to like what they were going to hear, and maybe try to, Paul says, it's on me, not our brother, Timothy. So he was, take, he was going to take the heat for it, so to speak. And though this letter was ex- sent to the church at Colossae, it was probably also meant for the church at Laodicea and Heropolis. And you can see that from Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16. And I guess it was meant for all of us, right? If you think about it, that the letter still has a lot of value for us today. Uh, Then Paul also wished for them the grace of God, which would bring peace. You know, we can't be at enmity. We can't be at war with God, so to speak, and have peace. It's just not possible. You know, I think that's why sincere people sometimes toss and turn at night. They know they did something that wasn't right, and, and it, it works on them, you know, because we desire to be at peace with God, to not do things that are against his will. And uh, in verses 3 through 5, it says, We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, having heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have toward all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in the heavens, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Yeah, Billy. Big question. First, what's a saint? And second, how can you be a sinner and a saint? How can you be a sinner and a saint? Yeah. What's a saint? You know what I mean? What is a saint? First, I don't know what a saint is. And how can you be both? Okay. All right. Uh, Let's unpack that a little bit at a time. A saint, you know, the word saint has got a, a changed meaning over the centuries, uh, especially our Catholic neighbors, like they like to apply sainthood to a person like uh, the Virgin Mary or Saint Peter or, you know. But the truth of it is, is all people who are in the church and numbered among the saved are saints. Saints, okay? And because all people sin, First John uh, chapter one and verse eight tells us that you know if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we're sinners, and I believe it's Romans four twenty three maybe that says you know uh, for we all fall short of the glory of God. You know, so. By definition, people that are Christians are saints, but we know it, we still sin. You know, we don't want to have a lifestyle of sin, but we still sin. So in that sense, we can be, both be saints and people that sin. Okay, Billy then, uh, Sharon. What you just told me then is as long as I repent, if I fall, I sin, and I repent, and then I change, and I don't fall to that same sin, then that's as long as I'm doing that process. But if you stay in the same sin, then you're not getting out of that. You're not doing that process. Basically what you're telling me, right? But broadly, the, the idea is that people need to be sincere about their effort to overcome sin in their life. You know, uh, as Christians, we are going to occasionally fall short. That's going to happen. But we can't continue to live in sin. We can't just accept it. 
oh, that's what I do. That's, you hear people sometimes saying things like, that's my weakness. And part of the problem with it, it might be their weakness, but when people talk like that, it's almost like they're accepting that. Oh, I'll never be able to beat that. That's just my weakness. See, that's bad. You know, we can say that we struggle with something and we have problems with something, but we should never get to the point where we say, I, I, I just can't beat that. Because that's sort of, that's when you start running into trouble, when you're giving up on battling some sin. And Sharon had a thought, and then we'll come back. Oh, Kathy, I guess first. Go, go. Sharon in the back had a thought, and then. That's all right. I was just thinking that saints were, I was always taught. Was, it set Could you apart speak from, up a little bit, Sharon? I struggle to hear sometimes. How's that? Is that better? That's better. So I've always been taught that saints were set apart from the church, you know, as saved for a special purpose. And sometimes it seems like we forget about the grace of God because we'll never be perfect. But by the grace of God and our willingness to repent, I think I, I, I see that as, I guess, what is the difference between a sinner, somebody that's constantly sinning, and a saint, somebody that's actually trying. Yeah. And sometimes uh, we, we struggle with the way the Bible inter interprets perfect. Perfect in the biblical sense doesn't mean sinless. What it does mean is someone that's spiritually mature, someone that's far enough along in the faith that if they do sin, they recognize it and refuse to stay in it. You know, that's what, you know, the idea of perfect in the Bible is. Okay, Kathy. I um, grew up as um, um, in the Catholic religion, and... Mm -hmm. I was basically taught um, something similar to that, that saints were someone who was appointed by, like, the Pope and stuff like that because of the good acts that they have done. Am I misunderstanding that? You are. You are. And that's because of your heritage, how you were taught. Uh, a saint is literally... In the biblical sense, anyone that is a faithful Christian is considered a saint. Now, uh, it's, I mean, we can look at other people and say, wow, that's a, an amazing individual. They're, they're very uh, faithful and they're great and everything. But mankind doesn't have the right to elevate someone and say they're super special, you know, they're a, a saint, like the you know, like Saint Peter. I mean, they are they're, they're a saint, but so are we, you know. And it's it's really up to God to do that, say who's a saint and who isn't. You know what I mean? And when others do that, I mean, it's well intentioned, and I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying, so you know, okay, Billy. I, I don't mean to interrupt the class, but Ben, I'm at a point where I just want to. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to take part. Like, I see what, the, I, I came and I saw what I wanted to see. I wanted I wanted the Lord to show me what a good Christian, you know, what good Christian men are like. And I am like what you just said a minute ago. I don't believe I can ever become that. And I don't believe, it's too hard of a struggle. I can't stop doing what I'm and I don't mean to interrupt the class, but I'm just letting, I'm just letting you know that's partly why I've been not coming to you. Just I'm, I'm getting fed up with. It. You know what I mean? It's not making it's not making my life any better. It's not making it any worse. You know what I mean? Like I'm stuck in that mud hole clay, and it's all wet. And I there's no ladder. Nobody's there's no ladder there. Let's let's start with this part, as we. Try to unpack it. And I appreciate your honesty. At least you're flat out honest about it. The first thing I think one of your great obstacles is 
you've already accepted defeat. I cannot do this. You know? And I, I think Scott would tell you from some of the books he follows that someone that is defeated in their mind is already defeated on the battlefields or whatever. You know? If, if you think you're going to fail and feel that you're going to fail, you're 90% of the way home to failing. So you've got to change that. And, and you're putting too much of the... You're putting too much of the burden on doing that on yourself. What I mean is, I, I'm hearing you say, I can't do it. And that's, technically, that's correct. But with the help of Christ, you need to build your faith in Christ in order to do the things. And, and Billy, like you, like you said, by your own admission, you haven't been coming as much, haven't been studying as much. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 something, maybe 4. What's that? 1017. Okay. I knew it was 10, but 1017. Uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you don't come, you're not hearing. If you're not studying, you're not hearing. So when you say you can't do it and you're lacking the faith to do, get there, by not coming, Billy, you're depriving yourself of the very thing that will help you get there. You see what I'm saying? By, by not, by giving up and withdrawing and not coming, you're putting yourself in a box where it's not going to get better and can't. Does that help? Yeah, and I'll put it like this. Uh, Billy likes to fish, I like to hunt. But if I would get up in the morning and say, you know, there's no sense in me going out. I never kill a deer. And, and then if I still do go, I'm not, my heart's not in it. I'm not doing the best I can do, so chances are I'm not going to get one. Same with you with fishing. If you said, oh, why do I even go? It looks like a fish? bad day. And, yeah. yeah, and uh, you're not going to fish as hard as what you, when you're enthused about something, you really put your heart into it, you do better. And that's the same way with your Christianity and everything else, I think. I think you've got to have good attitudes, and as Christians, we should have good attitudes. We should be happy. Yeah, we can't be happy all every minute of the day, but what I mean is we, we ought to be happy for what we have and what God has done for us, and we should try with all our heart and soul, uh, and we're not going to succeed every day, and it's not going to come easy maybe in some situations, but uh, it's the same with fishing. You've got to get up and keep going and doing the best that you can do and know how and learn more things to help you succeed. That's true. And Billy, one other thing I'm going to suggest to you. Don't, misunder don't misunderstand, don't underestimate the power of Satan. Satan's in your ear telling you you can't do this. He does that to me too. He does that to a lot of us. He, he gets in our head thinking, ah, oh, come on, give it up. What's, what's the sense? You, this is the tenth time in the last month you've did this, and you can't be. But Satan is the great accuser. Right now he's accusing you, telling, him you, telling you you don't have a chance. Just give it up, forget it. That's wrong. Don't listen to him. Okay, Sally? You know, I, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding something here, but my understanding, a saint is someone who is covered by the blood of Christ. I, I, I don't know that maturity, I mean, maturity is something that comes with that in time. But a new Christian is covered by the blood of Christ yeah. as soon as they come out of the water. Yeah, but there's I, a I, long growth process that follows that. Maturity isn't just overnight. It's something that it, can take a long time. It's something you should be growing toward, but I'm, yeah. I'm hearing what you're saying. Growing toward. Especially for I'm, new Christians. I, I yeah, get that. Yeah, yep. I mean, you know, and, and it depends, too, on, you know, your background. I, I'm not giving anybody an excuse because it's not an excuse. But there's different things. We start at different places. Are, right, we do. You struggle in different ways. And... 
one person it may not be a temptation at all, the next person it could be very difficult, where you could flip that coin with the same two people that something else could not be a struggle at all for you, but someone else it's like really difficult. You know, but a saint is someone that is covered by the blood of Christ. It's That's a good whether way to we put choose it. to stay in that blood and continue to strive and try. We're all sinners. I've tried and I've felt so many times that I don't really care no more. I'm tired of trying. Well, that, that's that's thing, bad, Billy. The heart thing. The, the I don't. I don't feel I have a heart for God. Like I don't feel I love God. I don't see this person. Well, that's I don't a problem, know this man. person. I don't see him. I I don't. He's not helping me. I'm not. You know what I mean? Helping you in what way, brother? Like I got children, Ben. They need things. They want things. And they want me in their life. And that creates, that takes money. You know what see, I mean? Billy, they're, they're, but see, you're asking God for... I'm asking God for me to help my children. Not, I don't want America to help my children. I don't want America to do that for me. I never asked for that. Right. I want, I, I, what I'm asking is to stand on my own two feet. Right. And, and you understand of... what I'm saying? In society. And I'm not. I don't. I don't want to use your welfare card. You know what I mean? I don't want to put my head down when I go buy a loaf of bread or a bag of rice. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I and understand. Is that wrong of me to ask it out of God and not get no answers and not get nowhere ever? And, you know and, what I mean? And I lost my heart in jail, dude. That's when it went away. I've been cold ever since. Yeah. I don't feel I love these people in here like I should either. You know what I mean? Like, I honestly, those are my feelings. This is how I am. Well, you're being honest, and... What, what I would tell you, you just need to go back with yourself and really reflect. You know, Jesus himself talked about, you know, the, uh, you know, if a king goes to war against, you know, he has 10,000 troops and the enemy has 20. He has to sit down and think about it. You know, am I willing to do this? And and you you have to have that honest conversation with yourself, brother. I can't have it for you. You know, you have to you have to say, am I got? Have I got what it takes to do this? Am I going to push it through? Ultimately, for your soul's sake, I I plead with you to decide that you can. But I can't make that call for you, brother. I just can't, Kathy. First of all, I want to say that I am so proud of. So honest and open, it's an amazing thing that you are even coming here to reach out for help. That is something that, is, that, that Jesus is doing for you to help you to that path to knock Satan off that other shoulder. Okay. Second of all, when you are baptized, you are baptized by not only the water but the blood and the spirit. Of Jesus Christ we take an oath when you are baptized to be here for you to teach you the ways to show you God's love everyone in this congregation I can guarantee you loves you and is willing to help you with this path you can't do it alone there's no possible way to do it alone but know that everyone in here is willing to help you feel the blood of Christ, feel the spirit of Christ come upon you. It, it, it's not going to happen overnight unless you're really, 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 really lucky, but um, it takes time. I got to the point where I was so down and so ready to give up. But Jesus fought for me. I heard his voice in my head when I asked him to, I pleaded with him to okay. take this burden off of me. Ooh. And you know what? He did. And I've never felt so good. He told me, Jesus told me to knock Satan down, 
tell him to get away from you. You are not welcome to be with me anymore. You literally you knock him down. You push him into the ground and you stomp on that ground and close that gate. Okay, so this is to summarize. So it, it's going to take it's going to take an effort, and Jesus never promised to pave the road for us. You know, you become a Christian you'll have all the money you ever need. You'll everything will go fine. You won't get sick. Never promised any of that. But what he did promise is all things will work together for good for the Christian according to his purpose. What's his purpose, Billy? His purpose is for your soul to be saved. That's his purpose. He's not so worried about the money things and some of the others that we worry about. He's worried about your soul, though. Okay? And so are we. Okay? All right. Thank you. Um, it goes on to say here, Paul had heard of their faith. And, they love, and the love that they had toward all the saints. So they had a reputation of doing the things which were right. You know, and uh, it's, it's good for people to hear that. It's interesting here that the prayers of thanksgiving for their faithfulness, you don't find that, though, in Galatians and 2 Corinthians. He still prayed for them, but he didn't pray for their faithfulness that they had because, frankly, they were weak in that area. You know, I can't pray for someone who's doing something sinful. You know, I, I can't do that. You know, I can pray that they break out of it. But Paul wasn't going to pray, thank God for their faithfulness when he didn't have it. You know, but for the Colossians, he was able to do that. Uh Going on then, uh, it comes to verse 5, it says, Which is come unto you, even as it is also in all the world bearing fruit and increasing, as it doth in you also since the day ye heard and knew the grace of God and truth. You know, there's hints throughout the New Testament of the widespread acceptance of Christianity. Christianity literally took over the Roman Empire in the first 200 years. The Romans tried to stamp out Christianity, and by the early 300s AD, the Emperor Constantine uh, made an edict making Christianity like the state religion. What's, what's not commonly known about that is Rome didn't have a choice. They were turned into the church and Christianity to try to even save the empire because it was crumbling. How ironic that the faith that they tried to destroy, they came crawling back to, you know, when they were in a lot of trouble. You know, and that's what you see here. Uh, some places that hints about the word of God uh, really growing is all those of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, that's Acts chapter 19 and verse 10. In Acts 19 and 20, it said, the word of the Lord grew and increased mightily. In 1 Thessalonians 1.8, in every place your faith in God has gone forth. And finally, in Philippians 1.12 and following, the gospel has become clear throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to all the rest. Even the soldiers and Caesar's own household had heard the gospel. The first century church did a wonderful job, you know, of teaching the world what they needed to hear. They had, it, they had pretty much taken the gospel to the known world at that point. Okay, in verses 7 and 8, it said, Even as ye learned of Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. See, the Colossians had learned the true message of the gospel, not only from the Apostle Paul alone, uh, remotely, but also from Epaphras, their minister. And they, they had learned what they needed to do to be the kind of Christians they were turning out to be. 
And now in verses 9 and 10, and I really like this, and I learned something from these verses. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make requests for you, that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. It's interesting, what are the things that Paul is praying for? He's One thing is the knowledge that was prayed for is the knowledge of God's will. You know, and I'm not saying that this is wrong. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Our prayers when we pray for each other tends to be for physical things, like they get healthy, uh, which is good. That's a good thing. You know, that uh, and different things that they get through some marital problems they might be having. Or we tend to pray for those kind of things. How often do we pray? Like, I can't remember praying this very much. But, for example, as Carl, I, I, I can't remember ever praying that Carl would gain the knowledge of God's will for him. Pray that he would find what God wants him to be. I can't remember making that prayer. Yeah, it's it's okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Did everyone hear what Linda's saying? It is okay. And it's, it's necessary, you know, to pray for people for their physical needs. But we have a greater need, don't we? We have spiritual, our soul, we have greater needs than that. And, and notice, and you can look at all Paul's letters. I went and started looking around. He was worried about the spiritual side first. And you see it continually. We don't do that as good. You know? Maybe we ought to rethink that a little bit. Scott? We, we live in a physical world. Everything's, everything we see and are involved in is a physical world. So we're attuned to all the things we need physically and want physically. We actually have to train ourselves to see things on a spiritual level. Absolutely. That we, we, we are tuned in, as Scott says, to the physical. That's what we live. That's what we see. And we tend to not give as much attention to the spiritual, which is actually the far more important. Do me a favor. <laughs> when you pray for me, pray for, pray for me that I'll find what God's will is for me. Pray for me that, as Paul talked to them, that I might walk worthily in Christ. Pray those kinds of things. I need it. I think we all do. You know, if I'm sick, yeah, please go ahead and pray for that. But while you're at it, pray that my soul is good because I find it interesting. I'm going to say it's, Second or third John, I'm not sure which 
the, the small little letters. Uh, when he talked to his friends, Gaius, he says, Brother, I pray that, how is it, that you may prosper in all things with the caveat, even as your soul prospers. You know, so the Apostle John says, we can pray that people do well, that they're prosperous, that they're living uh, comfortably, that they have great relationships. All that's great, but it's always in the context of their soul prospering. That's a big thing. And Scott's right. We tend to, we're myopic a lot of times on the physical. And, and we just don't see the spiritual. But, you know, let's pray for one another that we'll find God's will, that they, each one of you will find God's will in your life. Each one of, the, of us can walk worthily of God, you know, and, and that each one of us might bear fruit. Let's pray that. Jackie? It's funny that you are bringing that subject up because yesterday I was, um, I don't even know what the word is, I was around someone that was quite apparently not, she was just a nasty person. Okay. You know, and I, the biggest part of me wanted to lash out verbally. And it's somebody that has lots of issues. Well, they, I say, not just she. They don't have any, you know, financial. You know, but I thought last night when I got home, I, you know, I kept, I even started to type her a message. And then for some reason I thought, is this what God would want me to do? Bingo. Yep. And I thought when I come to church today. Jesus himself says, pray for those who despitefully use you. That's sort of hard, isn't it? <laughs> That's sort of hard, huh? This can kind of relate to, like, I think every topic we've hit on. But I think we really have to look. It's, it's really easy whenever you don't feel necessarily grateful for the situation that you're in to just not see anything. But there's always at least something. And probably in the last, you know, Scarlet's going to be four. In the last four years, I've never known such heartbreak and such joy together. And I really think that my children are the reason that I still come. I understand. I understand. And appreciate, appreciate that, you know. But that, let, let's start with that. That's a great reason to come. You know, that's that's a great reason to come. And you know, I need to pray for you that you will feel it for yourself as well. You know, and. And that's what these classes are supposed to be. These classes are supposed to be a time when we can share sorrow, share love, share... And, and we should be honest and open. And we're, we're here for you. you f feel free...
Yes, he does. I'm going to suggest one other thing. You, you, you talked about coming for your kids, and it's great. Keep coming for the class, because your insights are helpful. Keep coming. And that's all of us, you know. Um, let's pray for one another in our daily walk, because now you're hearing examples of people that say, I need prayers on the spiritual side. Let's do that. You know, because we tend to focus, like Scott says, we, we, we don't have, you know, the spiritual eyesight that sometimes we need, you know. Uh, we need our lens sometimes recalibrated, because we do tend to look at things from, you know what, I need more money. You know, I, I need this, I, all kinds of things. I do that. I do that. You know, and uh, I was teasing Scott. I said, boy, that new truck, man, that looks good. <laughs> you know, that type thing. We, we can be. You know, our greatest need is always going to be our soul. Yes, sir. What's that? Well, ultimately, that's better. Ultimately, money is actually the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is neither bad nor good. It's our attitude toward it. That's the problem. Oh, and when if you work Paul them, says we, it's, we brought nothing into this world and it's a certainty, we can't take anything back out. I heard an African-American preacher one time said he has yet to see a hearse with a U-Haul. <laughs> if you're doing what? something good, you if you're yeah, doing yeah. something good, uh, uh, oh, that, You do, you do. And you've got to work for it. You do. Awesome.